millions of us didn't feel freedom in their life. When I arrived here in the UK and in the US, I f feel the freedom for my first life. You know, I'm 55 years old. My son, he didn't see the, the sea in his eyes. He's 21. When can I feel this in my country, my own country, with my family, with my society? Hi both. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. We're very, very glad to have you here. Um, before we get into the, s the substantive matter of the book, a day in the life of Abid Salama, I'd ask you both to just tell us who you are and what you do. Nathan, maybe if you go first. My name is uh, Nathan Thrall. I'm a journalist. I live in Jerusalem, about uh, uh, two miles actually from the wall that um, encloses the community, Anatta, that uh, Abid lives in. And um, I've written a book about Abid's life and about the lives of the people who live um, in the same city as me, but with a very different existence. And before you came to um, write the book and, and also actually your penultimate, if that's the right word, most recent, um, what were you doing before that? So I, I spent a, um, a decade working at a, an NGO called the International Crisis Group, which um, does political analysis and in-depth policy reports um, uh, about uh, Israel-Palestine. Um, they do it all over the world, but I was the director for Israel-Palestine, and in fact, uh, during that work, I was constantly writing reports about latest flare-ups whenever those occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually, you know, uh, out of frustration with doing that kind of reactive work and constantly focusing on, um, there's violence, how do, we, how do we restore calm when the restoration of calm was the problem? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to address that. I wanted people to see this calm that we're asking to restore is a system of deep injustice. And we need to understand that. We need to put ourselves in the lives of the people who live through this system um, in order to stop um, accepting it and only asking that there be a restoration of calm when there's some upsurge in, in violence. I'd love, if we have the time, to come, to come back to that. So maybe at the end, we'll, um, we'll revisit that subject matter. Um, Abed, tell us who you are and what you do, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I'm a bit salam, I'm a Milad Sada. Uh, the main story in, in the book, Milad Salam, my son. I lost him in, in a horrible accident in 2012. Uh, I live in, uh, as Nathan said, in. Uh, in a village called Anata, it's uh, a part of not far from Jerusalem. But we can't uh, enter Jerusalem because we have uh, a green ID, Palestinian ID. So in this area, we have many, many problems. Uh, to the people who have blue ID there, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult uh, for us to live or to move or to uh, so I, if I can say, I, I met I met Nathan after he wanted to to write about our tragedy, this tragedy is what happened in my family. So he contacted me and we start uh, talking together about this tragedy. In the beginning, we refused. And my, especially my wife, until now she refused to speak about what happened, about Milad. Uh, but I agree for uh, two reasons. Uh, the first reason and the main reason, because I want, I do want uh, my my son to be buried like others, you know, I want him to to still alive his name to still him alive on, on the people tongues in the people memories also so this feeling make me uh, happy that I feel that I my son is still alive he's not dead 
this I feel this in the first uh, interview with uh, with uh, Nathan in my apartment uh, when he started to ask questions about uh, my son and what happened on that day I feel that he is uh, bringing uh, me my son bringing him back like he's he bringing his spirit again to life uh, when he start asking asking questions I felt that any milad is uh, between us sitting between us I felt him close to me especially because I didn't uh, when we bury him I didn't hug him because hug his body because it, it was burned and it was. so I like that I I think Nathan the first meeting start to open our in my injured my injured my bottom of my heart so uh, I felt yeah, I mean, that he it's good for me to to speak I speak a lot about Milad after these eight years the accident happened eight years before so he asked many many questions about how is Milad look how is he act how he smile what did he do in his life what did he like so all of these questions uh, take me back to to Milad's life so I was happy when I was uh, speaking about him at the same time at the same time I was uh, crying a lot so he, it's a very big big tragedy for us but uh, after that when we start meeting each other and maybe every day or two or so days after that I loved this and uh, the other reason was uh, Nessa wanted to focus about how Palestinians live under the Israeli laws in this area it's a rush area uh, we don't have any uh, at that time any any what is the you didn't have any emergency Emerg or yeah medical yeah. services you at, at this area in yeah. our village so I said maybe the book or what uh, Nathan will wrote will help us uh, to bring to bring th these things to our society to my people there yeah. I'll um I'd like to talk to you more about um, Milad as well during the course of this interview if you're comfortable doing that and I think um, it's important to say as well that what I really want to talk about is the second thing that Abed mentioned there the sort of the context in which recent events take place that rather than you know analyzing the multiple wrongdoings that are taking place right now I want to understand the condition of the Palestinian people and the condition of the occupation and what that means before we talk a little bit more about Milad could I ask you Nathan um, Abed mentioned blue cards and green cards um, for someone who's never been to Jerusalem they won't know what that means could you tell us yes um, so in 1967 um, Israel um, uh, conquered uh, the West Bank and uh, Gaza and Sinai and the Golan Heights and uh, immediately after doing that it formally annexed um, East Jerusalem and over in the lands of over two dozen uh, surrounding villages stretching from the edge of Ramallah to um, heading south to, to the edge of Bethlehem and one of these uh, villages uh, was Anatta, and uh, where Abed lives. 
And so in Anatta, you have a part of it that's formally annexed by Israel. It's considered part of uh, East Jerusalem within the municipal boundary. And as far as Israel is concerned, it's within the sovereign state of Israel. And as a result, Israel gave blue cards, permanent residency, to the people who lived in that part of Anatta. And the people who lived in the unannexed part uh, have green ID cards like other people uh, in, in other parts of the West Bank. Now, this entire area is surrounded by a 26-foot tall concrete wall. And uh, within it, you have families that have green IDs within them, blue IDs within them. The ones with the blue ID cards, the Jerusalem ID card, are able to leave through one of the two exits, through, the, through a checkpoint into Jerusalem. They can go to schools in Jerusalem on the other side of the checkpoint. Uh, and the ones with the uh, green ID card cannot and they have to apply for permits if they want to try and uh, enter Jerusalem. And, and on the day of the accident, these differences came uh, uh, into uh, sharp relief because parents rushed to the scene. They came to a bus that had been struck by a giant, giant lorry, flipped over and burned. And uh, bystanders who were at the scene were pulling children uh, uh, off of this bus and evacuating them. And if you were a bystander that had your own private car there, the emergency services weren't coming, you're on the other side of this wall, you're totally neglected. Israel is abandoning you know, tens of thousands of um, people who have blue IDs, are taxpaying residents of the city, ostensibly have the same rights as the people on the other side of the wall but are entirely neglected. I mean, even uh, emergency services being refused to, to cross over into these areas without an army escort and being held up and people suffering as a result. And um, so when the bystanders are pulling these kids off the bus, you know, if you had a green ID, you couldn't go to a nearby hospital in Jerusalem. So you dry off in a different direction. And so when a parent came, they didn't know which uh, hospitals their children had been taken to. Abed himself couldn't even check in a Jerusalem hospital um, if, if, his, um, if his son was there. One of the main hospitals in Jerusalem sits right on a hill overlooking where Abed lives, the, this enclave, this walled ghetto right underneath uh, the, the Hadassah Hospital on Mount Sc Scopus. Um, and so, you know, the, the story of the, of Abed in particular, but of, of all the characters in this, in this book and on the day of this tragedy, it's really a story of explaining how people navigate this system and what are the consequences of having a green ID or a blue ID and, and what does it mean for you on the day when the, the, the worst tragedy occurs in your life. So Abed, before we talk a little bit more about the events of that day, tell us about your son. Tell us about Milad, what was he like? Milad was a uh, was very very beautiful child. He, he was uh, gray hair, gray brown eyes. He was beautiful, cute, uh, calm, and shy. He shy from obviously. He he was like an angel, and not because of my son. Everybody around us loved this boy very very much. The neighbors, uh, our family, even anyone he didn't know him, and in life when he saw his photo, he 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 loved him. Uh, he is he, he like his hobbies was to draw and drawing. Sometimes uh, he liked to tell jokes and laugh on it. He was amazing. He's, uh, he, he was very cute. Uh, you know, we lost him when he was five. We didn't spend a lot of time with him. But uh, now, when I speak with you about him, I felt he's, 
I can't imagine, imagine him as a small boy or a big one. I can't, uh, I can't imagine his, 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 foot, his, his, how do he look now? You know? uh, everybody around us missed me, lad. No, not only us as his family, our father and mother, everyone, everyone. He, he was, when he was uh, two years old, he was like a toy between uh, the hands of the people around us, from our family or the neighbors. Uh, it's a big lose for us and for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so tell me then about the crash and maybe, maybe start the story, maybe with the night before and what you did with them. Uh, as I told you, for our kids, it's a, a big matter to go for a trip, you know, because they didn't allow to us to go to the beach, to the high for Yafa. We didn't have green idea. I said before, uh, my son Adam, uh, now he's 21 years old, he never uh, been on the beach. He never seen the, the, the sea all his life because they didn't give them him a permit. It's so only one clock or less to reach the beach from where we are living. So when Milad, uh, when they told him in the school, we are going to, to take you and with his class to, the, to, a, to a trip. So he was very excited at that night. He said, Father, I want to, do, I want to join this trip and uh, uh, the teacher gave me this paper to sign that you are agree. So I signed the, the paper, but I didn't pay. The, I had to pay the money, 100 shekels to the school because it was late. Uh, this was the day before, the, uh, two days before, when he brings the paper. And he buy many things for the trip especially kinder, kinder chocolate. He loved it very much. And some juice, chips, uh, things. Well, he was very happy because he, was, he wanted to go. So, and we go back home. Uh, I slept in, in the morning. I didn't uh, uh, see him before he, he, he go to school. He was, uh, he wake up early and uh, ask his mother, his mother to prepare him and, and uh, he was very excited to go. So I didn't see him. I wake up in the morning. Uh, we want to continue our job to, to, in Jericho with my cousin. So uh, I got in, the, in his car on our way to Jericho. I received a phone call from my nephew after at eight and a half in the morning. And my nephew asked me, he said, Uncle, uh, is Milad in the bus of the trip, Nurul Huda school? I said, yes, he said. He said, uh, asked him what happened. He said, uh, I think there's a big accident in the bus of the school. So we changed our way from Jericho to the to Jaba Road where the accident happened. We drive quickly. The weather was very, very uh, stormy. Before we reach the the place of the accident, maybe two or three hundreds before there was a checkpoint that didn't allow to us to pass the checkpoint uh, in, in the car. So I jumped out from the car and I start running to to reach the, the accident. The raining was heavy and uh, the storm, the weather was stormy and I couldn't even run anymore. Until now I didn't know from where I've got this power to run to. 
So on my way up the, the hill to the place of the accident, uh, a military jeep pass, a military, Israeli military jeep passed on me. I, I, I wanted to stop them to, to take me up there. They didn't agree. They passed me. So I continue my running. When I reached there, uh, there was uh, nothing, many, many people there. The bus was in his side, burned totally. And the, the truck also in, in, in the other side, the truck all crashed in. So I started to ask where's the, where's the children, where's our children, where's the boys? Uh, some people told me they took them to Hadassah in Kirin Hospital in Jerusalem. Some others said they are, took them to a military base behind uh, the hill. Others said uh, to Ramallah main hospital. So the easy way for me to go, it's to Ramallah Hospital because I don't have uh, a permit to entrance, uh, to enter to Jerusalem. They, they, they didn't allow to me to go to Adas Hospital. So I asked two guys from there, I don't know them, to take me to the, to the hospital. So they took me. There was uh, traffic at that time. It took me more than an hour to reach the, to the hospital there. When I reached the hospital in Ramallah, there, it was very, very crowded. Many, many people was there. Families looking for son, for their sons, and the media, the police, and people who came from all of Ramallah and all, all of, I, I feel that all of Anata is in, in, in the hospital. So I went to the reception, asked the doctor, I asked, I told him uh, my son was in the bus. Can you tell me where I can find him? Where can I find him? Uh, when he looked at the list, he said, uh, "No, he's not here. He's in. He's in. He's not in the list. His name's not in the list. In this, in the bus." So I uh, go out and uh, emergency entrance, and I make a phone call for the same teacher. Uh, my friend wife, she said, yes, Abed, uh, Milad is in, is in the other bus. I think he is still alive. He's, he's well, I'm sure. So I uh, took a brief, I mean, if you want, and uh, I wanted uh, to know where's the other bus. They told me the other bus is in his way back to Anata. So I called my brother. I told, I asked him to wait for the bus in Anata and to see if, uh, if, if is Milad okay or not. Yeah. It took an hour, okay. But after that, my brother called me back. He said, no, Milad is, is, uh, is not in the bus. He's not in, in the other bus. I didn't find him. So I called the uh, teacher again. I told her Milad is, is, is not in the bus. Yeah. My brother Chico, but he's not there. She said, I'm sorry, I bet to tell you that uh, before, uh, the, uh, the list is not correct. Yeah. They took uh, six boys from the, this bus and put them in the other bus. I think Milad was in the, the bus who did the accident. So I started again looking in the, the hospital, room by room, and asked everyone, I know him there, if he see Milad, if he knows where's Milad. Uh, everybody said, no, we didn't see him, we didn't know about him. I go back to the reception and I told them, they said they, we didn't uh, know anything about Milad here. Maybe he's in, uh, Maybe they took him to Hadassah Hospital. So I uh, called my cousin who have blue ID. I asked him to go to Hadassah and check. So he go after also one or two hours, he called me back. He said, no, Milad is not here. 
At that time, I I still standing in the same place in the entrance of the hospital. I refused to. I gave my phones to my nephew and my brother. They were with me. I refused to answer any media. They wanted to talk me, to talk to me, to ask me. I refused. Uh, I spent hours in the same place, thinking where's Milad, where where he could he could he be, where's Milad could be, and waiting for something and for any news. After hours, you know, if uh, things going to be cleared and everyone from the families found his uh, his son so uh, in the end of the day a uh, doctor come to me and he, he said uh, hey, you didn't find your son I said yes no I didn't he said we have uh, six bodies for small children, their bodies are burned. We think Milad will be one of them. Uh, you know, in this situation, uh, what shall you say? You know, uh, I lost the hope in that. Uh, I can see Milad again or not. Uh, so he asked, uh, he asked me to call uh, my wife and Adam, my son, to come to the hospital to take, to take uh, blood from them for the DNA test. So I called them and spent an hour alone in the hospital and thinking what happened in the same place. What will happen? How can I face my wife? How can I face my son, small son, Adam? At that time, he was only 11, 12 years. He loved his brother so much. What shall I tell him? So when they arrived to the hospital, my wife was shocked. I look at her eyes, she was shocked and she didn't want to believe any what happened then. She even didn't ask, where's my son? She didn't ask. Maybe she knows from inside that she lost her son. Adam was uh, looking at me with, uh, I didn't, I can't explain what his looks like at that time. In the beginning, I thought that he is blaming me. Why, why did you send my brother to to this trip? So they took uh, blood from us, and they said, uh, you know, there is nothing to do here. You can go home, and tomorrow we will call you and give you the results, because we didn't have here uh, this equipment for this kind of tests. We want to send this to the Israelis. So I took my wife and my son back. We go back home. The, there are many, many people around our house. We have a big family there. We spend all the time, all the night, with people around asking and I didn't, and even they didn't give me a chance to, to cry or to shout or, or to hug even Adam. I want, uh, from my inside, I wanted to run away from this place, and but they didn't allow to me. Anything. So in the morning, uh, we received a call from the hospital. They said, uh, yeah. Milad's body is uh, one of those who killed him in the, in the, in the crash, in the accident. And they asked us to come to the hospital to take the, his body. 
So I went uh, alone with my brother and nephew and some members from our family back to the hospital. Uh, I went to the same place where I was standing that last day. His body was then in, in front of me, in the back, meters, meters in the back of me. I was standing all the time and my son's body, his, his body was meters behind me because, because of that I felt that I, I didn't want to leave that place. So we signed the papers where he's buried and uh, I wanted also to join, to go with him back in the ambulance. My brother refused him. He said, no, you can't go with, uh, with his body alone all this way back to Anata. So he took me with his in his car. We bus the same street. It's the only street where the accident happened. When we, when we received Anata, reached reach to Anata, arrived to Anata, uh, there are many thousands of people waiting for us. Uh, they took his body quickly from the ambulance and we pray, they pray in the, in the mosque and they take it again quickly to the cemetery to the grave. I didn't see even, I didn't share to carry his body also. They didn't have many, many people. So I don't know they, what, what did, why did they did, did to me? Why did they do did this to me? So in the grave, they put him in the grave and bury him. And uh, uh, go back. With, joined the people in the, a big hall for this occasion. After midnight, we go back home. I go back home. I found uh, my wife lying on the, in the bed, shocked, looking like this, alone. She didn't want to speak to anyone. So I. Uh, there was no place. I don't want to, to hurt her, so I. The only place I. I th I thought at that time that I maybe I can cry in the cry in the in the bathroom. So I entered in my bathroom and start crying. I cried for more than a half an hour. Then she came to me and hugged me, my wife, without crying, without saying any word. Uh, after that, you know, people start coming to us. You know, you know because it's an accident, the lawyers um, came from all. Uh, Milad was the only one who had green ID from the kids whom did. Uh, the Israeli court refused to accept our case because he has uh, a green ID, not a blue ID like the other. They refused. This is the other thing and who shocked us and they, they they treat us that the, my 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 son blood is comes in a second uh, step second second place. second place not like the others and this make me this hurt us also and another tragedy for us they refused our case I don't want anything only to punish the man who crashed that bus to punish to punish them. And uh, day by day, month and by month, we uh, lived our pain between us, my family, until we thought that uh, everyone is for forget what happened to us. Until 
ne sen kam to visit us am to to us what happened with Mila? I'm so sorry about it. Um, yeah, I can see it's emotional, obviously, for you to talk about it. And to be honest with you, it's it's emotional just listening to you talking about it. Um, Nathan, why this story? Because I, I, it sounds almost to cheapen it, but many children die in the West Bank, in Gaza. They die in Israel. Why did you want to tell this story? What was it about Abed, about Milad, that made you think, this is the one I'm going to tell, rather than perhaps, you know, um, maybe more violent ones, maybe more specifically political ones? Um, why? Um, there are a number of, of reasons. Um, but to answer the last part of, of the question, you really hit the nail on the head there. Um, I wanted to take something that happens all over the world. I didn't want to take an, ex an event that could be exceptionalized, some <coughs> dramatic bombing or act of violence um, or major raid by the Israeli troops into a, a town. Um, I wanted to take something, a car accident, that happens everywhere and show how every single aspect of these people's lives is political, is shaped by the system. And um, the very fact that these things happen everywhere, but they're so very different when the victims are Palestinian, when they occur on an Israeli patrolled road in Area C on the other side of this wall, what that means for the people there and how that can illuminate the entire uh, story of Israel-Palestine, the entire system that um, finds its way into every aspect of these people's lives. That was really the aim of choosing something that's um, seemingly less um, uh, political than, um, uh, than, than a more obvious candidate like a, like a bombing or an attack. Mm -hmm. We'll come maybe to the politics in a minute, but just to talk briefly about the specific geography you mentioned there, because um, I think maybe one of you guys said earlier as well, there's an Israeli checkpoint quite close to where the accident happened. Yes. And um, as discussed, it was private people that took the victims to the hospital. That's right. Let's say it wasn't a car crash. Let's say it was some instance of law breaking, something that Israel perhaps perceives as a threat, yeah. the response, do you think it would have been different? Yeah. The speed at which people arrived? Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> I tell the story of a character, uh, of a man uh, who um, heroically um, rescued he and one teacher who passed away in the rescue. They together, saved dozens of children. This man was just a bystander on his way to his work. He pulled his car over, he ran to this bus, and he alone, together with his teacher, ran into a burning bus over and over again and is pushing kids out through a window. The, the bus is flipped on its side. Um, and this man uh, nearly lost his mind over what he saw and he was screaming and blaming himself at the end, I should have saved more, I should have saved more. Um, and um, he ha his work was done by the time the first uh, Israelis had come on the scene. And he wasn't just angry at Israelis, he was angry at any the Palestinian authority isn't, isn't allowed on this road, but they came anyway because of the severity of what happened. They said, forget the rules, we're, we were coming. And, and he was screaming at everyone, anyone in a uniform. He said, you killed these kids. How could you take so long? And one of the things he said, which I heard from um, uh, dozens of, of families in Anatta, uh, where Abed lives, was that when a kid throws a stone on that very same road, the border police are there in minutes, if not less. And here we have, you know, a, a burning bus, and it's more than a half hour before Israeli fire trucks come on the scene. 
Um, and and so, you know, the the I the episode. It's funny because I was I was I was asked by an Israeli interviewer a version of the same question, which is is was a more defensive version of the same question, which is saying, "Are you saying that the Israelis wanted? They saw." This bus on fire. There's a checkpoint right there. They could see the soldiers were there. People ran from the some of the bystanders who were helping ran to the checkpoint and begged the soldiers to come. One of them reported that they appeared afraid and they didn't. And they said stand back, but they didn't come with water or anything. Local uh, residents were pouring water from up above on a cliff. They somehow managed to bring their water tanks and help in the other direction. A minute away was a mil Israeli military base. Um, and the whole area is surrounded by settlements which have all kinds of uh, infrastructure. Um, and so this Israeli interviewer said to me, are you saying that, you know, is, is this book asserting as Salem, the man who was screaming at all of the emergency service personnel and police and others and saying you deliberately killed these children, is that what you're saying? And uh, the answer is no, I, I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that every single delay, every single outcome, the very fact that they're calling out on the radio, the Israeli emergency services, and they're identifying the location of the crash by the nearest settlement. Because even in their mental topography of this place, it's, it's where, are the, where do the Jews live? And so they, I, they called out, there's an accident next to the settlement, and a, and a police uh, responder drove into that settlement, went around in circles, exited in the wrong direction, came back, lost, you know, who knows how many minutes uh, uh, on this. And, and it's just every single aspect of that morning and how it played out was determined by a set of policies that are 100% deliberate. So while an individual emergency responder is doing his best to get there. And while, you know, even the medics at the base, by the time they came, they probably came as soon as they heard it. Um, the other kinds of emergency service responders said, we weren't familiar, even though it's an Israeli controlled road, Israeli police give out traffic tickets on this road. They said, we weren't familiar with it because it's an Arab area, because settlers don't really use this road now. Um, so every aspect of it, and just the biggest aspect, is the fact that it's on the other side of this wall in this densely populated area, which is filled with Palestinians that no one cares about. All of that was responsible for how that morning played out. And those policies are very deliberate, including even the very route of the wall. I mean, one of the characters in the book is the architect of the wall, who lives himself in a settlement. And the whole purpose of routing the wall in the way that it's routed around Abed's community was to lop off as many Palestinians as possible from the heart of Jerusalem to exclude them from the heart of the city, uh, while in the Israeli view, relinquishing as little land as possible. And this is the governing policy of, of, of so many actions of the state of Israel. I'd like to... Um... In a moment, we'll talk a little bit more about the phrase you used there about people not caring about Palestinians. Um, we'll talk about dehumanization in a second. But just to plumb the sort of intentionality of it a little bit deeper, what you're describing is, well, it, okay, is it fair to say that what you've just described is the failing of a bureaucracy or is it the intended result of a bureaucracy? Because whilst you might be able to rightly say that no individual emergency responder has intentionally you know, avoided the scene of the crime, mm -hmm. is the apparatus of the state, is the infrastructure that surrounds it, the very segregation of the roads. Is this maybe not necessarily the intended outcome, but certainly a possible or even likely outcome as a result? A hundred percent, it was a, it was a uh, foreseeable outcome. It was something that many uh, NGOs that write about Jerusalem and the problem of all of these people in this community, 130,000 people trapped in this, in this walled ghetto who don't even have a single ATM. The, the fact that the, they, the blue ID holders there had one option 
for a school, which was a, a municipal school, which is in a former goat pen. So they're, the, the parents, the reason they went to this school with, with green ID holders, with, with West Bankers, a school that was outside the municipal boundary but within this walled ghetto, was because they had no options for their children. And that was a deliberate policy. There was a shortage of classrooms of 2,000 2, classrooms. And these kids were doing double shifts. The schools were doing double shifts uh, to serve this population. That was a policy of deliberate neglect. W is the policy of deliberate neglect intended for there to be horrible tragedies that are that are like a, a, a bus on fire that, that nobody gets to until everybody's evacuated? No, that's not a... Uh, planned outcome, um, but the overall neglect and the f and the foreseeableness of this and other you know there have been other incidents too fires in 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 these areas where the the fire trucks uh, are held up at, at the checkpoint and the and the the checkpoint won't let them through. Okay, let's talk a, a little bit about dehumanization then, because some of the reaction to the crash on social media was um, well fairly repugnant to be honest with you for the. For the um, viewers who might not be familiar with it, I'm sorry, I'm going to just read out a couple of comments. But it, things like, it's just a bus full of Palestinians. No big deal. Too bad more didn't die. Um, another one, great, fewer terrorists. And it turns out actually that a lot of these commenters were teenagers as well. Could you speak to the, the dehumanization that characterizes each group's view of the other and perhaps what feeds does that possibly feed, you know, what's going on at the moment in terms of the current conflict, the targeting of civilians and the way the conflict bleeds over from the military into the civilian? Yeah. Um, it's one of this, the saddest parts of this story and of the bigger story of Israel-Palestine is the level of dehumanization and brutalization and we saw one of the ugliest episodes of it several days ago. Um, and we're seeing it now in reaction to what happened on Saturday. We are seeing uh, the army is withholding water, electricity, uh, and, and food from 2.1 million innocent people. And everybody's uh, standing behind that. Um, the, the, one of the, the themes of the book is how much pain and trauma all of these characters have, including the, the, some of these emergency responders, the Jewish ones, who are, you know, they come upon the scene of this burnt bus and backpacks scattered on the ground, and all they can think about are the suicide bombings that they had to come and, and, uh, and deal with uh, uh, years ago. Th these people, Israelis and Palestinians, have... Um, have dehumanized one another to such a degree, and uh, that that we are are witnessing um, the the worst the worst brutality that that w that we've ever seen in this place, and and I fear it's it's only going to get worse. To to what extent is it fair to describe this system of management and the system of governance that's imposed on the West Bank, also on Gaza? And, and to be fair, the, the complete enclosure of Gaza. Is it fair to use the term apartheid to describe that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there is at this point a consensus in the international human rights community that, that uh, Israel is practicing apartheid against the Palestinian people. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the leading Palestinian human rights organizations, Al Haq, uh, the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, Al Mizan, the leading Israeli human rights organizations, many of them, Betselem, Yeshdin, and others, they have all come to the conclusion that Israel is practicing apartheid. And um, I could go on. The UN Special Rapporteur, a, a, a letter signed by nearly 3,000 leading Israeli and Jewish American scholars called The Elephant in the Room. Um, the, the former director of the Mossad, the former he Netanyahu appointed director of the Mossad has said Israel is practicing apartheid just a few weeks ago. Um, 
I think that we have long passed the point where that is uh, debatable. And so we find ourselves in the situation then where Western leaders, um, whether it's the Foreign Secretary here in Britain, mm -hmm. whether it's President Biden himself, in light of recent events, rowing in behind uh, Netanyahu and the Israeli state. And, and actually, I don't know if you're particularly familiar with what's happened here in Britain, but particularly in relation to the, the siege of Gaza, we've got James Cleverly saying that he supports Israel's rights to defend itself, which is collective punishment, right? It's a war crime. We've just listened to Abed's incredibly emotional, personal trauma before we even get to a conflict. What are the political forces at play here, to your mind? What is, why is it that when we look at the human rights abuses, the potential war crimes, the suffering of people like Abed, why is it that people are turning perhaps a blind eye to it or that it doesn't land in quite the, quite the same way? What do you think is going on there? I think that part of it is that uh, the whole world has gotten really uh, sick of this uh, conflict. They are, um, don't want to hear about it anymore. And it almost seems as though it's kind of over to them. They hear about normalization that Israel's making with the Arab states. The Arab-Israeli conflict appears to be over. There is some issue with the Palestinians who are so weak, but um, we only really hear about it when there's some outburst of violence and then Israel uh, reacts in Israeli terms. You know, it quote unquote mows the lawn that's the, the, the term used by, by Israelis for, you know, periodically flattening uh, Gaza. Um, and, and so I think everyone has just become accustomed to this being um, normal. And, um, and, and because we're only focusing on it when there's extreme violence, we're, we're really ignoring the deep, deep causes of that violence, which are continuing to recur, and it's not getting less bloody. Um, and and as far as you know, the the UK government and the US government, I mean, they they have been for decades now entirely complicit in in Israeli violation of Palestinian human rights, and. and um, I, I do not foresee that changing um, anytime soon. Abed, I almost, to be honest with you, I almost feel um, dirty talking about the grander politics at play here because it's your life. You experience it and we, you know, we're talking about grand, you know, America, the UK, Biden, Netanyahu, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you're the person that has to experience it. You're, you're the person who survives it. And I wonder your view on kind of the politics of the situation. Why, why is it in your mind that we perhaps have become a bit disconnected from the everyday experience of Palestinians? As Palestinians, we, are, we long time ago, we know that uh, the UK political abolition and the Americans are bring this the Israelis and put them in our land here and uh, what before Balfour Balfour yes yeah. and uh, we, we don't know why are they supporting them uh, we know uh, many many people in UK here or in the US or around the world are supporting us as Palestinians because they know uh, the truth, our, uh, our life, how, how do we live there in Palestine. But we didn't know, uh, we didn't know until now why are they supporting Israelis. Yani, yani all the, all the, uh, it, the international laws allowed to us to defend, to defend ourselves. But they gave, they gave the law to the Israelis. I mean, we, this is our land. We live in this land thousands, thousands of years ago. And uh, they bring settlers from all the world and they took our lands, our houses from us. And uh, they said they, it, 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 it's, it's theirs. So every day we are uh, facing with, with the settlers around us. I mean, 
you know, I, I for example, I, I live in, in Anata before Oslo and before the war. Uh, we have, uh, we, uh, my family is a big family and we have many many land around Anata. So our land, uh, as uh, Salama's family, reached to Jericho. Uh, 32,000 uh, kilometers our our land, Anata. Now we live only in, uh, in 900, less than 900 kilo, uh, kilometers, all of us. Square meters. Square meters, yeah. So uh, the, the other uh, uh, took them for settlers and for uh, base, military bases. And uh, when I was uh, too young, 11 or 10, 11 years old, I was, uh, there was a, a spring called Enfara, not far from Anata. We went there together, play to play and to swim. Now they put a, settle, a settlement in the, near the spring and they didn't allow to us to pass. If we want to pass, we have to make a, a long, long way around the settlement. And they, this is our land. Oh, yeah, we have land inside there. It's, it's for my, me and my family. They, uh, we pay money to, uh, to them, to the settlers, to allow to us to to go down and to, to spring to, to the spring to play to swim or to play or uh, I don't know any if anyone want to see the truth he can ask any one who lived there not Palestinians yeah, like Nathan Nathan is he, an American. Why, why uh, a person like Nathan write a book like this and uh, wanted to the world to see what what is the suffering of Palestinians there in, in, in West Bank or or in Jerusalem? Why we didn't pay him money because he is a human. He 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 see the truth. He see our situation. He every day he saw. Our suffering with those people, with uh, with the settlers, with the police, with the, uh, with the army. Uh, anyone want? Uh, any, we, we are. We, why? Why we shall uh, lie about what happened to, to us? This, this is the truth. This is what happened to us. I, I'd like to just to, to add something, which is. I think that one of the reasons that there is this um, uh, incredible uh, numbness and also a lot of ignorance about the, the, um, what's happening in Israel-Palestine is that there is this um, concept of uh, it's temporary. And so many people are able to dismiss what's happening there because they say, of course this is Obviously, these people have no freedom. They live side by side with people who have every, every right. Uh, this is a system of ethnic subjugation, but it's a temporary occupation. It's only this way because we haven't resolved it yet. The resolution is coming. And so, you know, let's focus on discussing and debating you know, the details of that resolution, which is some hypothetical future that may or may not ever come. And so the idea of temporariness facilitates permanence. It facilitates continuing this thing indefinitely. And part of the idea of this book, let's look at a day in the life of Abed Salama. Let's look at what it means to live in this place. Abed's gonna die in this system. It's not temporary. And, uh, and, and we need to focus on what his life is like now. And we can't keep telling ourselves this lie that it's temporary and we can ignore it and we can debate, you know, two states and one state and all of this, um, all of these hypotheticals. We need to deal with this thing that's existed for decades, for his entire life. He's a grandfather now. And, um, and so the idea of the book was to bring people into Abid's shoes, 
this is what it's like to live in this thing, and it's not going anywhere, and it's deeply unjust, and we are complicit in it. We are supporting it. The UK is complicit in it in all kinds of historically deep ways, and, and now politically, and giving carte blanche to co collective punishment in Gaza, and, and the US is a, another story, nearly four billion per year in aid to, to the Israeli military, which is spending so many of its resources on maintaining this unjust regime. Okay, so you've mentioned the temporary leading to permanence. And earlier, at the, right at the beginning of this conversation as well, you mentioned about the restoration of calm, right? And how, again, that also was a bit of a, a red herring mess no moment. It's, it's not the answer. What is, where are we, where, when we say, let's address the injustice, when we say, let's try to bring about an end to this system, what does that mean in practice, to your mind? Um, you know, at, at a, a very, at a very minimum, we need to come with just basic principles. What do we demand now? We, we do not accept that the international community and diplomats and whomever get to sit around and debate ad nauseum what kind of future we'd like in this place. And we're going to just accept this being the reality day in and day out. We need to demand change today. And if that's not the permanent solution, if you insist on there being a permanent solution, fine. Let that be a temporary thing. But now we need to end this injustice. And, and the most basic principle is that we cannot dominate another people based on their inborn characteristics. We cannot have two people living side by side where one, because he's born a Jew, and the other, because he's born a Palestinian, uh, ha the, the, the first has all the rights in the world and the second has, has none. I mean, that, that is, is unacceptable and it cannot be defended uh, anymore on the grounds that we haven't figured out what should replace it. And Abed, do you agree with Nathan? Do you think that's something that needs to happen right now? Do you think that is the solution to the problem? Yes, of course, I agree. One hundred percent, I agree with him. Because as a as a father, a Palestinian father, I want to to see my 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 children' future. There is no future. There is no future. There is no hope for any kind of future in in our life there. So I I want to leave something. I in the area where I live, it's very very. Uh, Rush area with many many bad and bad people live there with gunshots and with uh, drug dealers. When uh, Adam uh, was seventeen, I Adam I, his old, eldest son, my yeah. uh, my eldest son. I took him. I, we, I left my home there in Anata and I left to uh, to Ramallah to live in Ramallah because in this age, if I didn't any. Focus on, on Adam and catch and catch him right. He will go. And I don't know with whom. So I left my home for three years and lived in Ramallah because there is what was more safely for my family to live. And after that, I I couldn't then continue to to live in Ramallah because all of my family there in Anata and I trusted Adam that he will. Not yet. he will continue his life as usual as a good person. So we go back and uh, we we do our best as fathers in Palestine to to make our ch our children and better and educated, better health, better. But they and they didn't give us the chance to to do it and. Because we are under incubation, they, they didn't give us our rights even to live or for my young boy Adam to love. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we miss many, many, many things. When I reached here, uh, when I arrived here in the UK and the US, I, I f feel the freedom for my first life. You know, I'm 55 years old. 
uh, we miss this life in our country. There is no, there is no safe. There is no. Here you can go out and walk and maybe make some sports to run and walk with your dog and there we can. We can this life we missed it. We missed it. We we didn't know it. I I told you, and uh, my son, <laughs> he he know how to swim, but I, I told you he didn't any uh, see the the sea in his eyes. He's twenty one. So 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 is my fida my my daughter, the, young, the the youngest girl my fida she is twelve years old, all the time she asks uh, father how can we, I want to see the sea I want to I didn't see, it. I can't take her they didn't allow to us but there, there's no kind there's no permit, and there's there's no kind of permit to travel, only. They give you the permit if you need uh, medical uh, medical except, care. Except, yeah, yeah. To, to go to Al Makassar Hospital in Jerusalem uh, or to work. For you, yes, for uh, your son, because he's uh, small, uh, is too young. They didn't get, they didn't give him a permit because his age is too young. He's not married yet and have children. We hope in a, a better life for our children in the future. This is the now. This is the right time to to bring a solution for our issue, Palestinians. The only thing we wanted as Palestinians, I am no, I'm sure I know my people. How do they think? The only thing they wanted only to live to live in peace and uh, uh, not to fight it. They want to uh, to grow up their children in, in peace and in, in freedom. Uh, millions of us didn't feel the freedom in their life. I'm one of them, I told you. This is my first time that I feel I am free in, because I'm a free country. Uh, why should I feel this? Uh, in, in, in a place not, not belong to me, it's not my country. Uh, when can I feel this in my country, my own country, with my family, with my society? Abad, Nathan, thank you so much for thank coming you. in to talk thank to me. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.